Good evening. Welcome to the public board meeting of School District 72 Campbell River for December 19th, 2023. The Campbell River Board of Education would like to acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on the traditional territories of the Likudo people. Please note that there is a short production delay between the live events that you're viewing and the meeting participants. The question and answer function is open online for questions on agenda items throughout this meeting. And a final call for questions will be made after the last agenda item and questions will be addressed at the end of the session. So here we are on December 19th. Many Christmas concerts are completed. Many happy elementary school parents have gone and seen their children perform. Um, I know that there has been some social events that have happened around our district. And as we wrap up for winter break, I just want to thank all staff, students and our learning community for a wonderful 2023 year. Um, wish you the best of wishes for a holiday season and look forward to restarting on January 9th when we return to reg regularly scheduled classes. And on to Superintendent Manny. Thank you, Chair Eddie. Um, in a similar vein, I just want to thank uh, all the, the board of trustees uh, for a wonderful start up to the school year. And I want to thank all the school district 72 staff as well for a fantastic four months. And I just wanted to take a little bit of time to highlight some of the things that I've been able to be a part of uh, in these first four months. Uh, just some amazing reconciliation activities that took place at Kerry High uh, earlier in the year. I've been very fortunate to take part in uh, We Wukai Professional Development Days with teachers from Kerry High and I believe from around the district. Uh, we've had two sessions and looking forward to two more in the in the new year. There was an amazing district wide cross country run early in the year, earlier in the year at one of our elementary schools. Uh, Remembrance Day assemblies at both uh, Timberline was just amazing. Just a, the students did a fantastic job and it was very memorable. And also uh, Indigenous Veterans Day at Ripple Rock Elementary School was also very moving. Um, the volleyball season, the volleyball coaches and now the basketball coaches that are taking over, just wanted to thank them uh, and say it was great to be part of the volleyball season and see the, the kids playing. Christmas concerts and Christmas, event, Christmas events. I know Ripple Rock had an evening of uh, sessions throughout their entire school or crafts and other activities they had for their parents as well as all the regular Christmas concerts that are going on. Um, Rob Ron had a Christmas luncheon last week that I was fortunate enough to be able to attend. Uh, attended the Cedar Christmas luncheon today. That was just uh, amazing and awesome to see all the kids uh, getting fed uh, Christmas turkey and, and all the volunteers that were there. Wanted to thank those volunteers. Uh, and also just the student wellness fair that just took place recently at uh, Cary High. Just so many wonderful things have happened in this short time frame and I'm looking forward to so many more wonderful things as we turn into the new fiscal year. Uh, I just hope uh, as you chair Eddie that everybody has a restful relaxing uh, holiday uh, and can come back re-energized to do the best that we can for the students of Camel River. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item three which is the approval of the minutes of the meeting of November 28, 23 um and that um we have a mover uh Jeffrey gillis trustee harper all those in favor moved is there any business arising from the minutes seeing none is there any additions or alterations to the agenda Seeing none, um, moving forward into the approval of the agenda motion that the agenda is hereby approved as circulated. Trustee Gladish, seconded by Trustee McMahon. All those in favor? Thank you. So, report of the board decisions from the December 19th confidential meeting, Vice Chair Gillis. That's for yourself, if matters uh, pertaining to teaching, administrative, and support staff changes, and legal and financial issues. Thank you, Vice Chair Gillis. Um, there's no correspondence or public or agenda submissions. So we're moving right down to 11A, which is the chat GPT generative AI presentation by Superintendent Manning.
Thank you, Chair Reddy. Uh, so the topic on many, many people's minds right now is uh, generative uh, artificial intelligence, chat GPT. Um, in fact, uh, well, I'll get to that in just a minute. So I've just put together a, a little presentation uh, for everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about what it is. Talk about a little bit about how it works and what are our options as an educational institution and educational school district how do we deal with, with all the AI technologies that are now coming upon us suddenly. So first, I just wanted to explain a little bit about what chat GPT is. Uh, it stands for chat generative pre-trained transformer. And it's a, a, a language processing tool. And basically what it does is it allows you to ask the question and it will generate a response to your question in the form of an essay, a paragraph, might be a single word. It depends on the prompts that you put into the program. Uh, it, it, it generates human-like conversations. Uh, and the worry for school districts and teachers and schools is that students will begin accessing these programs uh, and they'll have AI doing all their work for them uh, and not having any critical thinking or creative thinking or work on their own. It was launched on November 30th, 2022, uh, and it was launched and created by OpenAI. And they launched this program, and within a couple of days, uh, they had a record uh, response, 80 million, I think, responses, or 100 million responses uh, to chat GPT and people using it. <laughs> instant. So what exactly is it and how does it operate? There's three modules to chat GPT. The first module is a pre-training module and this is where it inputs. It takes the input of all these different uh, texts, articles, websites, words, uh, and there's an encoder and a decoder component uh, to this. Um, this phase allows chat GPT to learn general patterns of language. Uh, such as grammar, syntax, and semantics. The second mode is called fine tuning. And in this mode, this is where ChatGPT uh, starts looking at writing, editing, translating, summarizing, and trying to figure out the, the details of how that codes and what that work, how that works. Uh, so they look uh, at all the information and they focus on keywords, expressions, and formats that are used in different types of writing and different types of coding. And the final stage is called the inference stage, and this is the most complicated stage. Uh, this is where ChatGPT actually takes a question and then generates a response. Uh, and they do it by taking all this information and they break it all down and they focus on the relevant parts of inputs and output, that, output text, and they ignore the irrelevant ones and it actually looks at the probability of a word being used in a sequence, and then it creates uh, a generalized response for whatever uh, the question was asking. So we decided to survey our uh, high school, secondary schools, and middle schools in Campbell River uh, to see uh, if they were experimenting with it, if they were using it, if they thought students were using it. So we surveyed all our schools. 71 teachers out of the two high schools and two middle schools responded to the survey. And this is what they said. First of all, we asked them, have you ever heard of chat GPT or generative AI? The first column is the yes, no response. Uh, the raw number is the 70 and the one, and then it's translated into a percentage. So only one person hadn't heard of it, heard of it who took the survey. 98.6% uh, of the people had heard of it. We then asked, have you ever used it? 66% of the teachers said yes, 34% said no. We asked, would you consider using it? 73% said yes, they'd consider it. 13% were a hard no, said they would not consider using it. And 14% were unsure. The next question we asked, do you think there is an educational merit to chat GPT and generative AI? 59% said yes, 10% said no, and 31% were still unsure. 
next question we asked is, do you think chat GPT and generative AI should be banned by the school district? 11% said yes, 54% said no, and 35% were unsure. So we asked teachers, what are your top concerns uh, regarding chat GPT and AI? We asked for, we, we listed the top four concerns. The first one was cheating and plagiarism. So teachers feel like uh, students are just gonna use this tool uh, as a way to do their work for them uh, and not have to do any work themselves. Uh, the second biggest concern was the impact on learning outcomes. So teachers felt that uh, students wouldn't actually be learning the outcomes that uh, they were requiring, that uh, the computer would just have the answers for them and they wouldn't have to learn at all and they'd forget about it as soon as they had it in the assignment. Uh, the third concern was uh, building encouraging technical reliance. Teachers felt that students would become so reliant on technology that they won't really be developing creative thinking and critical thinking skills. And the fourth one was they worried that it might replace human interaction. Uh, so that one on one learning, that one on one capability were some of their biggest concerns. So I should point out too that uh, that survey was taken about a month and a half ago. Uh, so the answers to those questions might have changed, especially in relation to have you ever used it or would you consider using it? Because uh, it's evolving all the time. And uh, now they have programs that have evolved to such a state that they can take a math question, a math problem, analyze the math problem, tell the student whether they got it wrong or right and tell them why it is wrong or right. And the student can even ask the program, well, what did I do wrong and how do I, how do I solve this problem? And the uh, AI will tell them how to go about it and provide them other sample questions that are very similar to the question they just answered so that they can practice on them. So it, it's, that's supposed to be launched next year, which is 10 days away, 20 to 15 days away. <laughs> um, so we know that uh, it's here to stay. We know it's going to progress and get better. You know, just as I just explained, it's, it's going to keep evolving. And now the big question is, you know, what are we going to do about it as an educational institution? So I think first of the first thing we have to do is frame some ethical questions. Uh, students need to know why getting AI to write their work is wrong. They have to almost equate that to getting to paying someone else to do your assignments for you. Uh, it's it's very similar, except for uh, many chat uh, GPT programs are free, so they don't even have to pay for it. They can just go and do it. But they need they need to have an ethical understanding that they this is not right. Secondly, students need to know where the line is. If they choose to use AI, how do they use that responsibly? So we have to teach students that. If you're going to use AI, you need to cite your sources. Uh, you need to explain to your teacher how you used it and show your teacher what words were yours and which words were generated for you or which maybe it's just the outline that was generated for you and you put the input in there. And that's gonna be a working conversation between students and their teachers. And then I think when blatant violations do happen, when a teacher knows that someone has uh, used AI for an assignment, they need to use them as teachable moments. So what they need to do is they need to preserve their relationship with that student and realize that just like with any new tools, there's a learning curve involved. You have to make room for mistakes because we know they're going to happen. And I think you have to continue as an educator to learn how to work with your students. And, and there are, uh, I'll just mention that um, there's some really informative uh, videos and information out there that uh, we have sent to our secondary schools and middle school administrators, hoping they'll pass them along to their students, uh, and or, sorry, to their teachers. So teachers can go over this information with their students. We had a student council meeting, uh, a month ago and the students in that meeting were telling us that yeah they're they use AI we had a conversation about it uh, they said their teachers also have programs now that they can run uh, their essays through these programs and that 
the AI on the teacher side, the teacher's AI will tell them whether that was generated uh, by a chatbot or by ChatGPT or some type of generative AI. Uh, so it's working both ways. This can be a tool for both teachers and for students. I think, uh, you know, the future is not waiting for us. It's here right now and it's been here for just over a year and it continues to evolve. The question is, how are we going to instruct our students to use this in a responsible <clears throat> way? And how are we going to work with our teachers to move forward? And, and this down the road might be no more than a tool like textbooks used to be uh, back in the day. Um, so I think we have to be positive and open uh, and learn forward. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so many questions, so many comments. Um, so ChatGPT uh, goes back to 2021, so nothing is is current up until 2021. Um, so that I guess has to be understood. Um, I think that the kind of work that we do with principals, teachers, you know, to help them get a handle on this will determine how useful and helpful it could be with our students in the classroom. So I'm kind of hoping that this sort of discussion that you've started with with principals and you know senior staff and all that is going to continue to happen so that we keep aware of how it's developing, uh, how it can be kept really useful and not just another tool that we kind of have to monitor, mm -hmm. you know, so um, yeah, I have many other things, but those are the mm -hmm. foremost thoughts that come to mind for me. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, uh, the thing that comes to mind for me is that chat G P G P D will, will um, be the start of many, many things to come, as you suggested. And so really our, I think the basis of our concern needs to lie with that ethical piece mm -hmm. and that the role of adults in the lives of uh, learners and the role of teachers and administrators is always to default to that ethical base, to that um, grounded in human decency and responsibility so that whatever tools we have coming our way, we always assess them and use them in a way that is that is mindful of mm -hmm. ethics and the way in which we need to treat each other. Yes, it's interesting. else? I, I think much like uh, Trustee McMahon has said. I, I I've said this before, and I thought this is that it's often uh, it's very much like uh, coaching people or teaching people about expected behavior. I think that we all have a responsibility to make sure that we don't assume everyone understands what's expected or how things can be used, but we guide them and we make them aware or conscious of those ethics because I think ultimately it's it's our journey of learning as opposed to the end product that's really important and we need to develop that confidence and that sense of I can do this and there's nothing greater than a feeling that you've accomplished something even though you maybe had to make access of some of the tools and resources that are, are, are there for you. So um, I'm excited. I, I think, you know, we continue to learn, we continue to grow. We are not the beings we were 30, 40, 10 years ago. And this is just one more of those things that I think is going to prompt us to evolve, as we say in our current strategic plan. We are evolving for the future. Anything further? Uh, just as a final thought, I think this is an exciting opportunity, not only for students and educators to have those ethical discussions, but also for parents as a resource to help their child that may be struggling in certain subject matter to lean into technology a little bit to help guide them um, in assisting their child's learning. And as trustees and as an education system, we are we are required to think in a future kind of focused mindset and long term cycles. And um, I'm excited to be part of this ethical question as um, as AI 
begins to come up in education. So moving on, thank you. Yes, Superintendent yes, Manning. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to electorate and board matters. Um, so we have a couple of policies this evening. Uh, the first one being uh, the board govern governance policy review committee recommendations regarding board governance policy number 33, naming or renaming of school facilities. Yes. As, as you know, we're trying to be proactive in terms of reviewing many of our policies and our governance policy um, has put forward the board governance policy 33 and it has been circulated and there do not appear at this point to have any comments or concerns regarding the policy. So we would like to propose that the board adopt the governance committee's recommended edition of the board governance policy 33, which is naming or renaming schools and facilities. And we'll need a mover and a seconder. Uh, Trustee McMahon, seconded by Trustee Briggs. Is there any discussion? Trustee? Uh, uh, this um, section uh, um, on the second page, page two, where it says where the name of the facility no longer aligns with board policies. I was just wanting to just bring that up a little bit because I'm not even sure I quite understand the intention behind that. So I, I just wanted to make sure that I was clear on that. If anybody can help me with that. No. Um, I guess it could be that a, a, ball, a policy may change in terms of, for example, that we may uh, no longer wish to um, name institutes after people. I know many districts have changed policy over time so that they're no longer. So it, it might be something that would, would um, be in line with a change of policy that we might make. And so that this policy would ensure that we were consistent with other policies that are in existence. Um, do you have anything further, Trustee McMahon? Oh uh, no, I think I think um, there may be values that evolve in mm -hmm. terms of the uh, terms of reference for the board that in the future may not align with naming of schools. I mean, as we've seen over the course of history, you know, names have come up for scrutiny that at the time of their uh, being given were considered quite appropriate and now we're not. So, uh, you know, this is kind of taking into mind that we may move forward in that way in the future. Okay. Well, that, that helps a lot. And, and I, I think it's very thorough and very detailed. So I appreciate the work you've done with it. Thank you, Trustee Gladish. Any further discussion? So moving to the vote on the motion that the board adopt the board governance committee's recommendation to add board governance policy number 33, naming or renewing of schools and facilities. We have a first, we have a mover and a seconder. Uh, now for the vote. All those in favor? And it's moved unanimously. And another electorate and board matter, which is um, the board covered, this is a notice of motion. So this motion will, um, this board governance policy will once again be posted on our website for public feedback and review. Um, and I'll turn it over to Vice Chair Gillis to describe policy number 34, public interest disclosure policy. Well, our, our uh, governance committee would like to propose for consideration uh, draft policy 34. It's called the Public Interest Disclosure, and it's sometimes known as the Whistleblower Safe Reporting Policy, and it's consistent with provision of DC Public Interest Disclosures Act, and it's been circulated to all our school district partner groups for approval as well. Uh, it's recommended by BCPC, the BC Public School Employers Association, because it articulates the board's commitment to being ethical, honest and accountable in operations, programs and services to ensure a safe, open and transparent working environment. 
And the purpose of the policy and related <laughs> procedures is to provide a process for employees of government, both past and present, to report in good faith any wrongful or unlawful conduct without fear of retaliation or reprisal. So it's really an opportunity if someone sees uh, behavior that could be considered unsafe, could be considered unethical to report that without any feeling that there be recrimination. There will be procedure to go along with that, but that I think gives a fairly clear summary, or I hope a clear summary of the intent. Um, so, um, Secretary Treasurer Patrick. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Trustee Gillis has covered almost everything, so there's not a lot for me to add. Uh, but the legislation was put in place December 1st. So, uh, currently, as of right now, the staff and the school district is bound by this legislation. So, this policy is the board governance portion that commits the board. Um, and there also is a procedure, and it is the procedure that's out for review and comment from employee groups right now. Um, the board policy, we hope will pass at the next meeting, but we'll wait a little bit further to get other feedback before the procedure goes in place. So either way, this is in place and we're, um, we're bound by this legislation. Protection is in place for all first staff members. Um, and uh, we'll have the details and the operating of the <coughs> procedure um, within about a month after the government's policy gets passed. Thank you so much, Secretary Treasurer Patrick. Um, so at this time, this is just a notice of motion. Um, the board governance motion notice of motion will be posted on the FP72 website if um, and available for comment or feedback for anyone that might want more information or has any comments regarding fee policy. And thank you to our employee groups for uh, reviewing the the um, working policy, the operations policy that will accompany this governance policy. Uh, so moving down the agenda. We are on to port. There are no educational issues at this time. We're on to 14A, which is the finance uh, warrant of October 31st, 2023. Um, again, this is a standard accounting procedure here in SD 72. Um, it is uh, it is submitted monthly. So the motion is to um, that the finance warrant number four, dated October 31st, 2023, um, be accepted as presented. Oh, may I have a mover? Trustee Briggs, seconded by Trustee Gladish. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. And on to 14B, which is the long range facility plan, Secretary Treasurer. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not looking for a motion and we're not looking for any more money on this one. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want to let the board know the uh, 10 year facility plan is required by the ministry. It feeds into the capital plan, which is where we go and we'll ask the, the Ministry of Education for capital projects, new schools, additions, mechanical upgrades. Uh, and why it's important is if we're asking for a mechanical upgrade of a school that's no longer in the board's plans, they won't approve it. So they really want to see that the board has thought of it. Um, a strategic use of facilities in the future and going future. Um, ten year facility plans can be done at once at least every 10 years and they <laughs> can be updated more frequently, uh, but ours is getting close to the uh, 10 year expiry date. But there's been a couple of development proposals, approvals that I think are proceeding fairly soon in our community that this plan um, will need to address. So we're bringing it forward really a year before expiry um, to try to get ahead of that a little bit uh, if we can. Depends how fast that development goes. Um, with uh, with uh, the long range facility plan, it can be a very time consuming and large project. Um, the project itself will fall mostly on staff, but it will have some um, uh, 
reaching out to municipal partners for some of the planning uh, pieces of it. Um, but it probably right now it, it could take about three to six months to, to do. So we went and um, gathered a couple of consultants that who possibly could do the uh, reporting and um, a small panel of three of us interviewed them, looked at what their proposals were and what we were looking for was for somebody who could do a facility review as well as a plan. In the past, um, we hired somebody who did the review portion, but not the plan portion. Uh, and over the last couple of years, I've come to the board a couple of times kind of asking uh, support to, to do a review. But even up until about two years ago, I wasn't able to find somebody who was willing to do both parts. And then when I reached out to colleagues and found out who could do it, Currently, we found a, a number of people who were willing and able to do the poll. So we interviewed three different consultants, uh, and we have um, uh, we felt that Studio Hub, as mentioned in the report, is the best consultant to lead us through this. Um, their proposal was the best sort of comprehensive package uh, that will be delivered to the board. They also um included some review items that we hadn't even thought uh would be included but will definitely provide an enhancement such as uh, portable planning while you're waiting for additions for new schools so uh so they definitely provided some some enhancements there um again it, when we give them the go ahead, we'll possibly start in January, February and conclude by June, which is in time for the uh, five year capital plan submission. Um, now. We uh, one of the benefits of Studio Hub is. Um, so some of the some of the things that have changed since the last plan is we uh, the Supreme Court changed re-implemented class act. Uh, the previous report was prepared before that, so that uh, is a big change. We've got new development coming, but one of the biggest things that is, I'm not sure if you heard at the Trustees Association just like a couple weeks ago, prefabricated projects are a big, big um, initiative of the province, mm -hmm. and they're, they're lower cost permanent additions to school facilities. Uh, they're, they're like, they're not, portables. They're actually built in the schools and the cost of additions are much less than what a brand new build would be. And they actually spoke positively about possibly looking at multiple intakes of this per year. So um, and I believe the goal is to try to reduce the number of portables in school districts. Well, Studio Hub is one of the lead architects in leading the prefab uh, projects across the province. So they will be providing and, and bringing some of that knowledge and expertise to our plan, which then we're submitting a plan that goes to the province that then potentially will be leaning on uh, that project funding for to support the needs of students in Cat So there's a bit of a, a benefit there. Uh, when it comes to the cost, we have identified an internal um, uh, local co capital amount that we can pay for this. This will be less than $50,000. Um, and yeah, so we're not actually looking for any board uh, money or approval of board money for this initiative, but I did want to let the board know because it is a big project. It will have an impact on um, capital plans and it actually. You the board will be presented with um, priorities for schools and whether they stay the same as the previous 10 year plan or perhaps they might change. So um, so it'll be a pretty big um plan and exercise that's coming up in the spring thank you secretary treasurer patrick are there any questions trustee Gladish? i'm just wondering um they start in january and they finish in june of mm -hmm. 2024 will we be getting some kind of updates from them every now and then as to what their findings are so that doesn't all come as one big surprise at the end of the year absolutely so i will be the key contact and i'll have weekly meetings with them we'll have an advisory committee that will also be providing information to them um, when it comes to there will be no surprises 
right? And there will be some board decisions uh, will be brought in a timely manner. Um, we'll share the schedule with them as well so that we can make sure that everything kind of comes again. Board's not surprised and not rushed into making any decisions. So um, yeah, and yeah, looking forward to it because things have definitely changed in the last 10 years in Campbell River. Absolutely. Thank you, Secretary Treasurer Patrick. And just looking at the past facilities plan, yes, they they have changed extraordinarily in uh, the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. It appears our buildings have aged another 10 years. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. sur surprising, well, maybe not surprisingly, uh, the condition of our buildings has actually improved over the last 10 years. Wow. Uh, the, the ministry has provided substantial uh, capital uh, school enhancement funding, carbon sure. neutral plan funding, yeah. and through over the past eight years, it has actually had a positive impact on uh, the condition of our facilities. And that, that, that does address a reading <laughs> that, and I can see there were a couple of, of buildings that had improved, and yes. I wasn't sure how that happens, but I'd like to know in my personal self. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so staying to the agenda, guys. <laughs> On to um, 14C, which is a budgetary ask to the board for a new exempt position. Mm -hmm. uh, Secretary Treasurer Patrick. <laughs> Um, so I will take care of the budget side of that, but I don't know if I can ask somebody else to speak to the, the what and the why and the need for it. Other you want to start with that? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll finish up with the, 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 yeah. the budget approval is the big grant finale, so. Uh, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the uh, new exec position will be the position for uh, that is the executive assistant to associate superintendent Sismic and Morgan. Uh, that position deals with a lot of highly confidential information. Uh, that position also is a position that is uh, often required to stay over hours uh, or to potentially work summer hours through spring break. Uh, to stay late potentially at a board meeting or something such as that. Uh, so it was felt strongly that it was uh, not um, really an acute beat position that was bound by a set of time constraints. It also was a position that uh, we believe because it goes through the summer it needs to be a 12 month position, not a, not a 10 month position. Um, so for all of those reasons, uh, we felt that it was important to exempt this position moving forward and uh, now that the position has been uh, vacated we need to move forward with that and that uh, so uh, we'll look for the board to approve thirty thousand dollars increase in budget to support this change in this position um and uh that will yeah that will cover because it's an existing position it's not a net brand new um, uh, for a, uh, it adding of the entire cost of the position. This is just the cost upgrade between um, the QP position to the exact position. And sorry, I just wanted to mention one more thing that uh, there was uh, considerable uh, consultation with QP over uh, the exempting of this position uh, through the JCC uh, meeting uh, and discussions uh, so just wanted to make the board aware of that, that the, the QP is aware. Is there any conversation? Uh, Trustee McMahon? So did the um, changing nature or the evolving nature of this position just become more evident with the um, with the, the vacating of the position by the former? Uh, I'd say yes and no, but I, I think really the, the, the position probably needed this change uh, for a while. Uh, I think uh, many people were surprised that it wasn't already an exempt position. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some comments made to that effect that people just assumed it was because of the nature of the job and the hours that were being put in. Thank you. Any further discussion? 
I guess I just want to say, I guess I, I'm hearing that this is the opportune time because of the vacancy to make that change. Yes, it, is. It, it would be an opportune time because if we were, if, if this wasn't an exempt position, we'd be hiring a temporary human right. position and then having okay. to go through this process again down the road. Okay. Yeah. The, again, I've probably said this three times in the last two months, but normally we don't bring budget requests mid-year to the board. Mm -hmm. The reason for it coming right now is because it's vacant and yeah. there's that opportunity to do it to maintain continuity and stability in the position. Normally, this would go through budget and um, and come to the board in spring. So, and and thank you for that for highlighting that, uh, Secretary Treasurer Patrick, mm -hmm. because it is extraordinary, and um, and the opportunity of the position changing, mm -hmm. the position being held that's been long held by a long-standing QB member is the opportunity in which this ask is coming from. Um, so is there a motion attached to the budgetary ask? Yes, we're looking for board approval of $30,000 from the operating reserves uh, to um, support this exempt position. And I have a mover, Trustee Gillis, a seconder, Trustee Briggs, all those in favor. So move. I know that Darlana has long held that position, and I'm sure that she'll be missed. She's a. I, well, I think I don't think she's leaving. I just think she's leaving that position, switching position. It would be terrible. Okay. Yeah, I don't think Darlana is leaving. <laughs> so on to um, committee reports. So the SRD liaison meeting, uh, Trustee Gladish and Trustee Briggs, who would like to speak to it? OK, uh, so on December 6th, um, uh, Trustee Briggs, Superintendent Manning, Associate Superintendent Sismic and Secretary of Treasurer Patrick and I attended this public meeting in their beautiful boardroom and uh, had a number of things that were uh, discussed. Um, uh, a particular discussion took place around emergency preparedness uh, for schools in, in the event that there's an earthquake or, or some power outages stuff like that. Um, a motion was passed to explore a joint initiative between EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, um, Cortez, and SD72 to possibly purchase a generator, a, a joint initiative on that. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, housing on Cortez was discussed with regard to a situation of unstable housing for at least one teacher over there on Cortez. Uh, and uh, Secretary Treasurer Patrick agreed and has since provided a report on the housing that the board owns. So that's mm -hmm. already been done. Um, there were some questions about the Child Care Center on Quadra uh, with regard to um, the consultation, the work delays and uh, reorienting the footprint in response to community feedback. So uh, that all was uh, shared and I think all the um, information they needed was provided. So. We look forward to ongoing meetings with the uh, SRD in the future. Any anything else that anybody wants to add to that? Uh, question, Trustee Ritma. Was the entire um, SRD there or board there, or were there a number of representatives? I think there were representatives. It wasn't a the room wasn't filled. It okay. wasn't. Yeah. Two directors. Two directors. Um, two staff members at the table with uh, two staff support. Okay. May I ask who the directors were? Do you remember who um, they were? Director Rice and Director Wanish. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, Cortez um, and Cortez and Quadra representative. Yes. And Area G representative. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Okay. If I may, just because we're coming into long range facility planning and thinking about the Surge Narrows and mm -hmm. the Cortez Islands and teacher personages, is that what they're called? Teacher teacher is, teachers. Is, teachers. <laughs> teacher is, teacher is, teacher housing. Anyway, housing for teachers. <laughs> um, will that be part of the long range facility plan as well? 
No, and that's the second time I've been asked that question. So it is something we can add in. Um, we may still have room within the budget to do that, um, but at this point there isn't. So as the board may be aware, we have one teacherage, uh, and this request from the SRD is to look at um, teacherage at on Cortez or other housing. I know housing um, in school districts around the province for recruitment has range. It's not necessarily teacher did. Sometimes it's a uh, low cost. Uh, so there's there's different things and they were just opening up that conversation. Yeah. And does the ministry fund those kind of? No, 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 no. Is the one teacher you're talking, is that search narrows? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um. So I don't see any other business on the agenda. Are there any questions on agenda items, either online or from the gallery? A question did come in online. Um, it's with regards to the chat GPT presentation that Superintendent Banning uh, gave earlier. Mm -hmm. The question was, um, was if there was a reason that the alternate high school was not included in the survey. So I think, um, Leading into that a little bit um, or adding a little bit into it. I think they're asking about if the alternate high school teachers were included. Hmm. Um, there, there wasn't a reason to exclude them. Um, it might have just been an oversight if we didn't include them. Um, and I'm not sure if the teacher survey went just to the two high schools and the two middle schools, but we can double check that and certainly get information from them as well. Thank you. And any um, questions from the gallery? Um, Deb? Um, I am just wondering if the board has an idea um, as to the perspective of another budget increase coming to personnel, specifically either excluded staff or, or uh, admin positions when schools are being asked to be very careful with resources because it's, I mean, what I'm specifically speaking mm -hmm. to is I think this is the fourth budget increase that has come to the board in various meetings this year, asking either for an increase for administrative time or an increase to staffing of excluded people at the board office. Um, and schools are hurting. And I think the board needs to think about the perspective of what that looks like mm -hmm. to their employee groups. And I'm not saying necessarily that the work isn't needed. I'm just saying um, we still haven't rectified cuts you made in last year's budget to some of our employee groups, yet we're increasing board office personnel, increasing administration, and asking schools to be more careful with resources at the school level to help ensure that we stay on budget and on track this year. So I'm I'm the, the main question is I hope and are you aware of how the rank and file employees in the school are feeling when they see these kinds of motions coming to the board. Thank you Deborah. I don't have any response specifically for you. Um I am aware of movement outside of our general process and um and am keenly aware and hear and hear your conversation and discussion um besides that i can just acknowledge your statement at the current time and hope to further discussions at a later date point out i have taken a look at that we've added 13 teachers and we've had uh, added probably about eight QP since last year. But I would argue that that's directly affected by enrollment, which you get mm -hmm. funding for. You are not taking from surplus or other things to do that. But I know this is not a debate discussion, mm -hmm. but that's what my response to that statement would be. Thank you, Deb, for your for your comments. Thank you. Is there any other further questions from the gallery? 
Andrea? Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm thinking mindfully about uh, Jeff's presentation uh, around AI. I have a lot of concerns, as, as I think a lot of parents do, a lot of teachers do, a lot of support staff do. Um, yes, there there can potentially, I guess it's like any tool that can be used for good or it can be used for not so good um, reasons. Uh, my concern is is around bullying and the impact that that can have. We are already experiencing problems with kids using social media and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, with AI, it's it's going to get interesting. I think fraud is going to be a huge problem. And so I'm glad to hear that there's going to be conversations in, in the schools with students about how we manage this new reality we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. and, but um, I'm hopeful that there's going to be resources for teachers specifically around this because mm -hmm. we're going to have some challenges with this. There's no ways about it. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that there will be a willingness of the board to be providing those resources to teachers going forward. Andrea, do you have a response? Yeah, I, I just thank you, Andrea. I think, you know, as it was pointed out, it, it's, it's here to stay and it's not going to get smaller, it's going to be bigger. And it, it is an ongoing topic uh, around the globe. Uh, it, it's it's uh, big on uh, the BCSSA website. There's information, there's information on OECD has uh, uh, launched a number of reports that uh, are specifically speaking towards AI and, and what school systems are going to do in dealing with it. So it's on the mind of governments. It's on the mind of educational partners. So I, I think that those supports will be there and will be coming. Uh, and it's something that we're going to have to move for, forward with and, and dive into. Do you have a follow-up question, Deb? Um, yeah, just a, a follow-up question to that too is, I think the board, um, <laughs> they may need to consider other ways of ensuring that common messaging gets out to all user groups um mm -hmm. uh, like um consider a mechanism for for doing that um because we don't have the budget for currently um things like in service where we can ensure that all teachers or all eas or all secretaries or all whoever can get common messaging on a number of things that are affecting teachers right now. Um, there's a lot of new things coming at them, and we rely on professional development, which is teacher autonomous. Um, there's also some uh, discrepancy around different other stakeholder groups as to whether or not they do professional development or have access to professional development, such as our TTOCs. So I think as this tool and any others, as well as the other things that are already going on, like assessing and reporting and uh, new literacy initiatives and things like that, it's a lot to expect teachers to just do their own professional learning on their own time. And, and that's what is the current model in this district. There isn't a lot of in-service as opposed to professional film. So, and, and this is just one of the things that I think may be coming to I think that, uh, and thank you for um, allowing or for sharing that with the board. Uh, I think that these topics are probably best discussed in a liaison meeting um, where we can bring operations to the fore and start to begin to undress, undress, address, and unpack. <laughs> <laughs> and unpack some of these concerns so that with our operations team, with support of the board, we can start to move forward the in-servicing models or address some of the concerns that are coming forward through the CRDTA. So that's probably best moved over to a liaison meeting and we'll book one for the new year. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Um, and that's it for the, any, we're good? And the further 2023 board meeting, last board meeting of the year. May I please have a motion for adjournment? Trustee Harper, so adjourned.